Hello everyone, today we talk about Siena in the late medieval centuries. We have already made a uh, history of the city before that, so you can always check the medieval Tuscany or Italian communes playlist, etc. Or for that, I will um, insert some links in the top fixed comment below. So I will not give too much, say, political uh, say background aside from what it's also the case uh, in the changes, but we've seen essentially the rise of uh, the, the Sienese commune to a, a very uh, important uh, level within Tuscany. This was essentially the third most important, the second most important city um, in, um, in the region uh, by this point. Um, and at the beginning of the 13th century, uh, allied with Perugia and Orvieto, in 1228 with the Republic of Pisa, Pistoia and Poggibons. This alliance was essentially an anti-Florentine function, aside from the occurring changes. But as we've seen, Siena had basically grown as one of the most important cities in Tuscany, together with Florence and Pisa. It was a continental power. Uh, it fought mostly against the, um, uh, the Florentines for the control of the northern frontier, also with other communes all around to maintain firm the connection with the sea, because was again was was not a maritime commune, but uh, it could control some of, of uh, in fact ports, some of them in the Maremma, uh, to essentially uh, profit from the grain imports that especially from uh, Sicily, were helping feeding the ever larger uh, populations of Siena herself, but also Florence uh, and more. Uh, at the beginning of the 13th century, we see Siena allied with Perugia and Orvieto in 1228 with the Republic of Pisa, Pistoia and Poggibonzi. This alliance was essentially an anti-Florentine function, because, again, the the northern rivals had always been battling um, to, uh, at, at the frontier to strip Siena of strongholds. Siena was basically doing the same. And of course, there were many different alignments depending on the ever mutable, changing uh, communal policy internally, uh, externally. And we can't, in this single video's track, all what was going on, and not even for the, the, the same Siena, that, by the way, had really a lot going on. Um, we will surely make other videos more in-depth to explain single battles, single wars, that uh, are definitely uh, quite fascinating. Siena, as we'll see now with Bontaperto, would be one of the protagonists of, of medieval Europe, this is some of the largest uh, engagements uh, at the time. Uh, and at this point, Siena is fun fundamentally Ghibelline, right? Siena is uh, yet another city that, despite not having kind of a strong um, ancient foundation, having developed mostly in the early Middle Ages, as we saw in, in the other video, had developed uh, an innate uh, sense of um, traditional alignment with, with the Empire, with the... this. If you want even a sort of Germanic tradition, it was a lot um, in, in, the more, in the more peripheral areas, especially in southern and eastern Tuscany with the Longobard past, for example. This was just, say, a contingental reason. Siena, as we will see, will become actually and an strongly Guelph, but not before a, a bitter struggle. We are, again, in the 13th century during the reign of Frederick II of Hohenstaufen, King of Sicily, uh, aside from Holy Roman Emperor, King of Italy, King of Germany, um, uh, and more, as a matter of fact. And we remember before the Sicilian grain in the role that Siena played uh, in, um, in, in Tuscany. So having uh, her allied with the Ghibelline cause was definitely uh, a matter of concern, especially for Florence, that already had a rivalry going on with, the, with a very powerful... Um, uh, maritime Republic of Pisa that was yet ba basically here Siena and Pisa were closing access to the sea from uh, the, the interland and uh, 
the strategical implication also on the friend, uh, on the road of France, right, and, and those major arteries leading to Rome from from the north, etc., was was crucial for Frederick's policy, wars against the Lombard League, um, the Papacy in Central Italy, etc. Et right. So Senna was very loyal to him, helping uh, the emperor with troops and money uh, in in during his enterprises, and on. Frederick's death, Senna remained loyal to the house of the Stauffer that, um, albeit troubled, right, was still firm and even more than before in control actually of Italian affairs through Sicily, right? Uh, Germany was essentially decaying, fragmenting, and so on, but especially Manfred, right, uh, the legitimate son. Frederick II was pursuing a policy that would es essentially radicalize and truly found the ideological struggle between what in fact we call the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. And Siena was a very powerful pawn in this and at the peak of Ghibellinism in Italy before the Angevin takeover. Um, in fact, uh, Siena was considered the very soul of the Ghibelline party in Tuscany. In 1224, the commune conquered Grosseto on the um, on the sea on the Tyrrhenian Sea, uh, together with the domains of the Aldobrandeschi. These were all families that, again, had uh, as we've seen in the many videos about the Italian communes, they had they, had, they were essentially uh, feudal uh, lineages that had in part urbanized and were scattered across the the districts of, of these cities and. Uh, gave trouble uh, to 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 the communes and that were uh, to to the communes that were against them. Right in this case, they had actually controlled one, um, so made it their own. Uh, there are the the, the counts of, of Santa Fiora, for example. There are this perennial thorn in the side, not to say else uh, in, in the Sienes in in the southeast, etc. So um, taming these rivals, and especially ensuring uh, the control on one of the major coastal um, cities here was uh, of pivotal uh, importance for, for Siena in her imperial Ghibelline uh, policy. However, uh, the tension increased uh, a bit everywhere in the mid-13th century. Uh, we've seen the death of Frederick II and the coronation of his son Manfred as King of Sicily. Um, that he managed to do so, by the way, spreading uh, the the fake news of his uh, nephew Conrad's de alleged death uh, in Swabia. You know, we'll talk about him later. But he was definitely a very powerful, uh, very powerful uh, prince. That the most characterly resembling to his father, by the way, among the various and unfortunate children of Frederick. Uh, Manfred, uh, by having worn the Sicilian crown without papal consent, in observance with the original idea first by um, Constantine and then by Frederick, so the head of the empire's direct vicar of God, uh, regent of the temporal power with the pope only as the exponent of the spiritual matters, Thing was at least much more nuisance since the beginning of this all, aside from how it developed in the West, but uh, as, as elsewhere, by the way, um, stood uh, in open rebellion against the uh, the papacy. Right, he was uh, excommunicated, just like his father had been, with unprecedented consequences in the relation between the empire and the papacy. Because, again, the, the most radical struggle started exactly now on the base of uh, this ideological confrontation. It had never reached such bitter tones and defined, um, say, factionalism, uh, even uh, at the time of Frederick II. And Tuscany was the fulcrum. Uh, of uh, the the questions settlement as Manfred so in Siena the most important strategic asset for his own political design a wedge loyal to the empire placed between 
the, the Papal See and the champion of Guelphism in Italy. That was Florence already emerging uh, as such, right? Uh, also in Florence, there were struggles between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, in fact, that were to be settled through uh, major battles uh, that, as you understand, would in inevitably entail uh, Siena to, to have a, uh, a great role in. And it was for this reason, in obedience to uh, Frederick II's plan to put an end to factional struggle and restore imperial power over all of Italy, uh, to bring about essentially a social peace that Manfred set about reinforcing the Sienese military system, sending 800 uh, heavy horsemen, right, uh, famously uh, German mercenaries, right, that had been essentially since the time of his grandfather Henry VI the way um, uh, the, the Sicilian kingdom had uh, procured itself its military uh, given the, the great wealth of the country, but the collapse essentially of the feudal mechanisms that had previously regulated uh, the Siculo Norman uh, army, right? So, this were all, the, there is all a, a mechanism here the, 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 um, the rise of the German princes independent from a strong national monarchy that is basically falling apart in the country. Hence also the crisis of the ministeriales, of the um, serf knights that had been essentially the, the iron arm um, of, uh, in fact, of the emperors uh, in, in uh, Germany. And that now in crisis were finding employment opportunities in the thriving Italy that was now devoid essentially of, a, of an imperial um, uh, control. And this, this is the point about Manfred, I made a video about him, that is one, one of the single most overlooked uh, characters in, in medieval history, in my opinion, because uh, the level of control over Italy right, uh, that he achieved was essentially um, unprecedented right, from his Sicilian kingdom uh, with the hegemony on a, a Ghibelline system across uh, central and northern Italy that would have compacted, let's say, a, a very strong international front if it had not been for the the, the, the Angevin Crusade, right, the papal um, uh, interference, that naturally was based on concerns from other Italian communes that were Guelph, but just because they didn't want essentially to live in a, in a country hegemonized by, by a very powerful Sicilian monarch that just wanted to try, right? And so picking up arms just as they had done uh, at the time of, of the Lombard League, right? Ta the Tuscans especially are rising fast in, in um, economically, financially. They have uh, an ever greater international role. They finance all the major uh, Western European monarchies. Uh, reason for which whoever has such plans of uh, imperial Germany must rely on them, right? In 1251, Manfred had already welcomed, uh, forming a league with them, by the way, the Ghibelline exiles from Florence, including the famous Farinata, the Liberti, that is most notorious for Dante's um, portrait uh, in, in the Inferno, but that actually was yet Another, one of the single most important uh, European figures of his time, exactly within this, this mechanism, um, uh, Manfred had also, uh, just uh, by relying on Siena, uh, tied himself with Pisa, uh, with Pistoia, so that were opposing uh, themselves in the Arno Valley to Florence. With these um, more bloody feudal Ghibelline lineages of the Apenninic heartland were probably even some of the most um, loyally Germanic branches, we can say, um, in, in the Italian nobility, the, the Guidi Counts and the Ubaldini, 
and that were essentially specializing as mercenaries, right, and leading some of the, the armies, for example, of yet another Ghibelline commune that uh, was uh, an important cornerstone in this alliance, that is Arezzo, right, um, uh, an, an irreducible uh, that would fight against Florence, even when everything was lost, even when Siena, that with, with which you know it was very close, right, just bordering with him, had um, would, would uh, had already passed to to Guelphism, uh, later on. Uh, after first peace concluded in 1254, following uh, the some successes of the Florentines, the war flared up again first against the associates of Florence in Maremma and in the Chiana Valley, right? Uh, these areas, again, were held by some communes, also smaller ones, uh, rural villages, uh, single knights, uh, castles, etc., that um, were depending on, supported by Florence, and carrying out of course, uh, guerrilla warfare incursions on the Sienese district, uh, destroying the crops, all this stuff. The Sienese from the other side were doing exactly the same. It was It's an incredibly complex and uh, articulated uh, scenario that, again, I, I need to, to make an entire video just to, to explain in depth uh, in these years because things were also changing fast. When the Florentine army itself came against Siena to try to, to shake the, 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 the gibbling pressure off, right? They were famously beaten on May the 18th, 1260 at St. Petronilla, one kilometer from the city, by Siena's troops united with Manfred's German knights. This was a first taste that the Florentines would get during the summer, right? Um, Siena was evidently attacked just at its outskirts, but a much larger expedition had to be mounted up. And this gave start to the most famous campaign here, right? This battle is uh, the most famed one of Montaperti, again, one of the most, uh, at least famous, celebrated ones. There are actually many others uh, in this wealth Ghibelline struggle later on, also in the early 14th century. It didn't have the same uh, literary fortune, right, but they were much bigger, much more impacting, also internationally. But uh, this one is still we will make a, a video about it for sure, Some also multiple ones, because it, it's a bit... Um, the the body and soul of this sort of hybrid right from the uh, warfare of the time of the Lombard League right and something more advanced was taking place in Italy at the time that the Tuscan communes are the ones leaving us the first um, the first sources documenting it happening regarding uh, change in in tactics right the, the much greater um, development of infantry wings. Um, of specialized troops like the the pavisman, especially crossbow uh, fire, right? But still, um, large amounts of troops, um, complex uh, battle plans with multiple battle lines here, flank attacks, and so on. And this connubium also between the the Italian knights and commoners with the German mercenaries that made a hell of a job carrying out essentially the flank attack would disrupt uh, the Florentine army. Right? Put up a struggle. There was a lot, a lot going on really um, in uh, in the battle as well because the um, and there had been backs and forth in in Florentine um, in Florentine politics. Right, and there was a betrayal allegedly from in uh, in in the battle within um, the same Florentine army. Right, when were one of of the uh, crypto Ghibellines right uh, cut off the arm of the you know standard bearer of Florence, and, and thus uh, disrupting the order 
uh, of the formation. It, it, they are really brutal uh, engagements, right? That will, um, in this sense, really alter the uh, the balance of uh, Italian and European politics. Uh, the uh, this this the, the hate really, especially between Siena and Florence, uh, reached its zenith exactly in 1260, right? If if you look at it, the Guelph army was, by the way, very powerful, right? And it's also the only army in the entire Middle Ages to have been documented in its actual composition. You think that more or less, you know, of course the numbers, of course, of medieval armies, but we do not have any document telling us, like, look, these are the actual people. Like like a, like a document from Italian tells you accurately how an army was actually composed. There is no such thing except the so-called Book of Montaperti that was essentially, it's, it's the unique, the, the only, um, the only document ever existing historically to to tell us um, a great lot, right? Not even the completely, right? The picture, but there are, it's, it's a register that actually lists all the various troops that were called during the appeals um, uh, in the army. There, are, they tell you, I don't know why a guy wasn't there, who was um, there in his stead, how they had to be armed, and so on. And and this was uh, a normal book of the lots that existed uh, in medieval armies at the time already because that's how they they organized them right it their uh, their their actual bureaucratic administrative work was necessary to put this very large forces uh, all together right um and uh the, considered the the guelphs had 30,000 men so were essentially the the largest forces that you could have on, on the field uh, at the time um Plus, as we understand from the material wealth um, of, of these communes and how it's in fact attested by these sources, also very well equipped, right? And this this uh, book was essentially seized by by the Sienese after the victory, right? They found it in you know the, the Guelph baggage, etc., and was treasured by Sienna until in the 15th century when Florence. Um, basically managed to uh, to, to seize Sienese power. The Florentines brought it back to, to uh, their own city, and this was in the age of humanism. They, they tried, of course, everything from previous times. It was a sort of revenge, um, uh, still in the burning memory of, of that major defeat of their city, so that it was preserved for us to know. But we know, of course, the extent... You have to understand this. We, we have an idea of the extent by which such documents were produced, as much as the awareness that they have been lost, right? That gives you a dimension of how few we actually know um, about things that, however, we know were there, right, in very large numbers. Uh, and this is, again, uh, one of the, it's a unique source in, in the entire uh, medieval history, especially for for military historians, uh, people who are very interested, by the way, in the army organization, right? That doesn't talk about the battle in itself, right? It doesn't help. Actually, the battle is a bit of a mystery, like how, for example, the various forces were arrayed, the timings, the distances. Uh, it's not all entirely clear. At some point, I will make a video about the battle of Montaperti in that tactical detail, right? Um, the, um, the, the Florentine army was heading towards Siena, these were all coalition forces, but there were lots of other wealth from other cities, from other areas. And again, a massive army that is to settle, basically, the, the matter, because such large forces required, of course, the CNAs to move their entire communal force. And if they had been crushed on, on the field, Siena would have passed to the wealth side, right? So it was as... Uh, the size, of, as, as far as that is concerned, as it as it sounds, uh, and the Ghibellines were considerably less than the Guelphs, something between fifteen twenty thousand men. Um, this clash fought on September the fourth, twelve sixty. So the same year, Petronilla, where we realized that there had already been an attack, 
to CN, etc. So th this was normal. There were multiple campaigns during uh, during the season, right? And uh, the distances are not great, by the way. Um, and the, the location being, in fact, the town of Montaperti. Um, the Sienese, led by their commander Provenzano Salvani, destroyed the Guelphs. It was later famously said that the nearby uh, Arbia River went red in blood after the, the massacre of the Florentines, because um, here the uh, again the the normal tactics here were occurring with cavalry charges, right? They of course, have to be supported by infantry, but there were different battle lines. We do not understand exactly, even just in width, how the forces were distributed. We only know that the the final flank attack uh, of the Germans uh, brought to the um, basically to the collapse of the Florentine line and that the, uh, the the Guelph infantry resisted for a while but got broken as well and consider at that point um, infantry had no other choice but resisting till the end of being butchered um, along the way while fleeing right so it, it's um, it's all incredibly brutal um, the uh, Enormous Ghibelin victory led to upheavals throughout the Apennine Peninsula, while Siena considerably expanded her boundaries by acquiring Colle in the Elsa Valley, Casole uh, d'Elsa, Talamone, and the southern Maremma, Poggibonsi, Campiglia d'Orcia, Castiglioncello, and Staggia Senese. Siena was able to impose humiliating conditions of peace on Florence and regained on the frontier uh, with her northern rival Montepulciano, Montalcino, another lost lands that had been um, uh, never forgotten by Siena because at some point they were lost even without too much of a fight but just because of you know, weakness and contingental um, factors. So this uh, brought famously enough also to the establishment of a Ghibelline regime in Florence. This was a big deal because, by the way, after this defeat, uh, Florence was just uh, at the mercy of her enemies. But since there were Florentines within uh, the latter that also were, of course, looking forward to coming back to their own city and gaining control, etc. You have the, the famous episode of Farinata, the Council of Empoli, that basically prevented Florence from being raised to the ground, as basically the, the, Ghibelline, the, the foreign Ghibellines wanted to do, while the, the Florentines said, well, you know, that, that's our city. And, and, and to Farinata. Farinata was named uh, actually Manente, Manens uh, of the Uberti. It was known as Farinata because it means floor. It's a sort of foot that uh, is very yellow um, and it was called like that because of his blonde platinum hair. Right? People at the time cared a lot about this detail. So the fact of being beautiful was, was um, um, to be you know uh, especially for a for a knight, you know, athletic, robust, etc. But having this this sort of Apollonian look was a matter of metaphysical importance, right? It was a moral value to be beautiful, and this was deeply ingrained. You know, if you read the chronicles of the time, you realize that enemies also were enormously respected for their power, their look, how how uh, really in looking at their own integrity. Uh, as men, especially of, of politics, right? And there are lots of considerations about the fate of Farinata that, uh, as you know, wasn't the best because the Guelphs would regain, ultimately, the control of Florence. But um, the man has all a history that, besides what Dante painted, including the, the alleged um, accusation of Epicurism, right, uh, has nothing 
to do with that. Farinata was was not a heretic or whatever. It was just a, a common political slur against, especially the Ghibellines, who had supported Manfred, who was excommunicated, right? So all these were against enemies of the Pope, uh, uh, and uh, there were different considerations, right? Also, not just about this, but also Dante's personal memory beliefs that are quite complex. He was actually Ghibelline himself, right? But it, it was settled, of course, that at the time, right, the, uh, the cause of Florence was also the one of, of the Guelph party, aside from the eventual split between blacks and, and whites. Um, and actually, Farinata was a very good Catholic, right? And after his death, you know, he was uh, essentially thrown out of his tomb, uh, his uh, remains uh, dispersed because, but th that tells you the ferocity, right, of factional hatred uh, in the cities. And after Montaperto, you have definitely a period of Ghibelline power extending uh, across the peninsula, abroad, Manfred had great uh, international connections, so dynastically that would later trigger, for example, the Aragonese intervention in Sicily because he had married when it was like, they, 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 there was a sense that this guy was somehow the heir of, of the Swabian legacy. Uh, and you have in 1266, naturally, the crusade, Right, that um, Urban IV launched against Manfred um, and with Charles uh, of Anjou essentially uh, coming, like also receiving uh, money from Tuscan moneylanders, eventually would have been rewarded, right, as Welfs, right, fighting against uh, this Ghibelline block when he would have conquered Sicily. Right, so you have first Benevent in 1266, that is the death of Manfred, right, and so the the end also of the Ghibelline regime in, in Florence. Then in 1268 you have the Battle of uh, Tagliacozzo, uh, in which the young Conradin that had been otherwise victorious against all his opponents in Italy had, had gained a lot of support from within the same country to fight against Charles that had uh, settled uh, in um, in Sicily at that point uh, was um, in fact captured uh, by some traitors uh, and e executed by the same Charles of Anjou on the market square of, of Naples and this was um, by far the uh say the most effort uh, action led by Charles and, and the papacy there is uh, a, a legion right in in the death of Conradin that then an eagle uh, came down the sky and um, wet her claws in the blood of, of the of the adolescent right as a as a memento as a symbol of you know the imperial cause uh, and right but as you know uh, the Angevins established themselves after that defeat firmly in southern Italy they pursued essentially the same universal scale policy that the Hohenstaufen had tried to do like that Henry, if Henry VI had not died he would have conquered um, uh, Constantinople just eight years before the, the Venetians and the French did. If the Sicilian Vespers had not broken out, actually, the, the Angevin army to, to conquer Constantinople that had been lost um, to the Palaiologo again would have actually succeeded, right? So history would have gone in very different ways. In any case, the Angevins succeeded also in replacing themselves as the hegemonic power in the Italian peninsula, and, and thus sponsoring dramatically the wealth um, uh, party uh, in, in the various communes. And so very few Ghibelline regimes survived, yet not eradicated. The same Ghibelline party of Tuscany survived these blows. And it would live on, right? Because there's no point in which these regions are completely just Guelph or, or Ghibelline. Right, but the 
issues for Sienna definitely were connected with this um, side and uh, the end of, of the Ghibelline Sienna's was near as well. In fact, the commune united with the Germans of Conradin of Swabia that had found their employment right uh, in this rich commune while succeeding victorious in a battle near Arezzo were in turn defeated eventually near Colle in the Elsa Valley in June 1269 right so basically within uh, less than, than a year from the the Swabian debacle. Provenzano Salvani, that had remained at the head of Siena's Ghibellinism after Montaperti, um, was killed uh, in the fray of this battle. So this man, again, were very much into the, the, the business. He understood that... Um, Siena's Ghibellinism was waning with him, so he tried all, right? He gave his life, uh, and, you know, this is what it means to, to die responsible for your, your political convictions. And there is, of course, a regime change in Siena. Guy de Montfort, that is the, the vicar of Charles of Anjou, that of course is looking forward to tame this uh, stronghold of Ghibellinism, establishes a wealth regime in Siena, which, with numerous prescriptions and devastations, because that's what happened, you know, to um, to those who had been of the opposite side, of course, opened the series of those um, family feuds, by the way, which were later to undermine uh, the Sienese Republic in part. So basically you had lots of exiles, um, lots of their houses and lands confiscated. Some families could remain, the, the women, the children, etc. Uh, and of course there would be processes of um, pacification, like these communes of course cared about the political cohesion. Uh, so in, in the wake of these major uh, strategic changes there were uh, of course, uh, political reflections, but let's say also in times of troubles, you could find like uh, against a a common threat, for example, of course, uh, the recalling of all the exiles, uh, etc. And as we were saying before, also in in the other in the previous video, that there were really lots of again untamed noblemen in the Siennese countryside that uh, became a bit like the hosts of various exiles, uh, etc. Um, there is a peace, uh, finally, in 1280, so also considerably later, like a decade, it just tells you how ferocious um, the, the wealth coming back had been. Um, uh, this mm, treaty is brokered by the Cardinal Latinus Orsini, right, one of the most powerful prelates uh, of the time from this Roman uh, family well connected with the papacy and all. So the Ghibellines were thus readmitted to Siena and the government of the so-called 36 was replaced on the occasion by that of the 15 from which the families of the um, so-called grandi, that is to say the uh, the magnates, were excluded. This is a bit the, the trend uh, that we've seen also for other communes. Essentially, they were here reuniting, let's say, they were mm, with this new balance choosing, essentially, who would also with, with the forces of, joining forces with this Ghibelline exile, uh, less rulers um, for a more united guidance um, because the commune had been weakened by these um, the struggles again. I cannot digress on all the various expeditions, but every year you find I don't know battles in the district, uh, the communal army intervening against the exiled, and vice versa. As, you know, there is all an external sponsor from the, all the various surrounding communes, and, and of course interference in the in the same. Plus, things are changing for 
for the in international situation. Uh, the papacy, first of all, uh, has began to feel the pressure of the Angevins, so close to... By the way, they shifted the, the Sicilian capital from Palermo in Sicily proper to, to Naples, because it's also closer to Rome. Uh, Charles of Anjou has, uh, has become senator of the Urbs, etc. So that there is the sense that um, the Angevins are becoming as encumbered as the, uh, the Hohenstaufen had been. So the Pope reapproaches um, the say, the, the imperial power at the time, uh, the king of the Romans, Rudolf of Habsburg, that would never come to Italy, but would send troops um, uh, in the peninsula trying to readjust the balance. The, the, the papacy got something in exchange, that is to say the recognition of the, on the Romagnol areas within the papal states, etc. So there is a rebalancing um, at this point. A uh, reason for which the same Ghibelline party regained some steam they began plotting against the Guelphs. Um, so in Siena, government of nine members were reassembled in 1287, all from popular and merchant families. When we say popular merchant here, it doesn't mean like the guy that is, you know, making shoes or whatever. They were talking about major oligarchs that have the duty, by the way, to serve as knights, etc. That, um, however, are from that, let's say, new background, in fact, of, of mercantile business that had um, essentially emerged against the, the very originary and uh, most noble families of, of the commune, right? The, just the, the, what had been the militas originally. And there is a, a great um, paranoia, of course, uh, that works to, to some degree in keeping out the, all those who can make coups, right? So even some popular... Um, are uh, checked, are exiled, are somehow restricted in their political um, uh, rights, etc. Um, and this uh, government, the one of the knights, would be a quite successful one, right? It, it embodies a bit, again, here we are at the peak of the great communal civilization uh, from the late 13th to, to the essentially the mid 14th century. You have a Siena, as we will see now, emerging as one of the single most important cities in Europe uh, in terms of civilizational output, wealth, art, military power as well, actually, because after Florence, um, Siena was at least among the the wealth. Now, the the, the especially the commune had the not just the largest army, but apparently the most balanced also doctrine in terms of interaction of. Uh, heavy cavalry, heavy infantry, missile troops. Then, you know, all of Tuscany and, and the nine were quite wise. They they employed their military instrument very carefully, very without exceeding, always caring about various uh, families in the city, not to to become too powerful, checking revolts, uh, strengthening central power, uh, the, the central institutions, etc. And the the thing led uh, the city. Uh, far, as we will see. Uh, it was just the Guelph party that uh, was paradoxically de while destined to to actually emerge victorious in Tuscany in the following centuries, just not, you know, without um, a, a striking series of defeats, right? Because uh, Florence now led the entire, uh, the, the system was rising essentially as the leader, as a larger city, and Siena was large enough not to be sucked in, let's say, the Florentine hegemony, they remained in, independent as such, but they also followed Florence, right, against the, the, the enemies, the common enemies that now had, uh, the, were the Ghibellines. This judiciary consisted, in fact, of nine men uh, on two months shifts. Yes, uh, just in major, this, this was also relatively common as a, as a timing in this magistracy. Of course, it was all part, more or less, of same families that were extended also to considerable degrees of it was I remember this were essentially oligarchs in their own uh, regard but they still work collectively right they they watch over say the most powerful families not taking over the entire system alone and such by monthly timing was exactly functional to make everybody govern right a bit um 
D9 were chosen until 1318 by a commission made up by uh, Podestà, who was uh, essentially the, the holder of the commune, right? On, uh, still essentially directed by the, by the councils, by the statutes, etc. It was mostly a, a, a military commander right, of, of the communal forces um, in war. Uh, the captain of the people, because this was a popular government during the phase in which, again, the, this, it's mostly this uh, new, the, the old mili militia doesn't quite uh, say control power anymore. Uh, the councils of merchandise and the uh, the, the nine, the, the previous nine that were leaving their office, and, and subsequently, these um, nine were instead drawn by lot using the shell method because, of course, uh, at some point there was fear that, that well, the system was um, so relatively weakening that. Uh, in functionality that uh, the the appointment would be the election would be somehow still uh, controlled by those who had more power within so uh, there were some elements for protesting and it's already a big deal because it means that the system had left space for for those to, to complain uh, alongside the nine the, there was the communal council right presided over by the Podesta who also administered justice together with the captain of the people, uh, the Bicerna and the Gabella. These were some uh, offices where right, it had to do with essentially uh, the finances, administration, paying magistrates, and exacting tolls, etc. Remember, Siena is one of the top mercantile cities in, in Europe. Right, it's also a pretty large center. It, it works, as we've seen, all this sort of um, shifts in massive amount of resources without being placed, um, aside from this continental connections anywhere, like it, it doesn't have a, a massive infrastructural access, access to the sea or even a particularly you know, prosper surroundings compared to other centers. Nevertheless, it, it is incredibly rich. Right, and um, it, it has especially a, a very powerful banking system, uh, part of which exists to this very day, by the way. Um, among the various, if you look at, the, you know, the, there is mostly a French German uh, prevalence in the European Union as far as bank. The, 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 the third presence is, is the Italian that still has uh, some of the most important uh, credit institutions from the, the medieval foundations um, and uh, of, of Siena. It is fascinating. Um, so the, the Sienese magistracies were obviously occupied by Guelph at this point, right, belonging to the popul, the, the people intended in a as a political association, right? Not the say the commoners only. Um, from which the uh, the nobles that are called the magnate, the magnates, fundamentally, were still excluded, right? As in the past, as we've seen this system in the previous video, from 1277 were even included in a list of names, right? It was going to constitute a precise social estate. And in spite of the fact that this list was, of course, in fact, preventing the, the magnates from accessing certain positions, etc. Uh, these were still Sienese citizens, and as such, uh, they were uh, essentially the, 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 the freedmen, right? The, even there was a sense of nobility intrinsic within freedom, right, of, of the citizenry in Italian communes, right? Nobility, in the, at least in the original ancestral sense of bearing arms, etc. Um, and as such, they were, the, also the magnates were, of course, being... Uh, represented uh, among the the, the Sienes, right? They were considered part a part of the tertiary, the, the thirds of of Siena, right? We say the quarters, but they were sextiers, tertiers, and so on. And the communal councils, the uh, magnates participated in the guild of, of of merchandise. They continued to lead the army. That that also was quite important. That the Sienese were proud of their houses, of their contrade, the, the still the the famous um, 
competition, the game dates back to, to the Middle Ages, a, a race, right? But it stemmed from the the idea that these houses were representatives of greater order. There is a lot of private power in Siena going on, right? You have really um, displays of massive, um, also. Uh, autonomy in the organization of these forces, right, separated from just the traditional communal militia as such, um, they, the magnates can also enjoy uh, international diplomatic connections, so it was a, a soft um, control that ensured the nine to still essentially manage the more powerful houses, right, keeping an eye on them, also from a military point of view, um, within the city, uh, that there were literal soldiers that had to watch over the towers of these guys and so on, paid by the commune. Um, however, a sort of containment of both the noble and the subordinate people was being carried out um, because um, the this noblemen were traditionally Ghibelline, right, and the, the people were, generally speaking, messy, right, there were some sort of revolts that uh, occurred even just out of the, for example, the normal games that uh, happened, one of, of the battle, um, so-called, because basically, this was very common up to a few centuries ago, um, the, the there was a sort of paramilitary training for which uh, two factions in the city streets would start bidding that on and on the, the the big square right the the field square of that of, of Siena would start beating each other throwing rocks there were very there were peculiar regulations and the type of armor you had to wear in the circumstances but people got themselves killed and these were dangerous occasions because they kind they came up armed in in the major um Square where also the the places of government were, and they, they, they could even attempt a coup or something. And the the communal forces were always very updated, also in this sort of anti riot um, uh, actions. They had some of the finest equipment. They had catapults, right? You know, in case things got um, wrong, um, and they did. Uh, and so it's all fascinating. A lot of Stuff thrown and an incredible amount of stones thrown, especially that cost really a lot, even just to, to take off the, the square after these incidents were over. But it was sort of uh, a f- of lo- local festival folklore, right? And and they went by it, right? That what was the way that the people vented themselves. Um, and there are very interesting CNA's regulations about all this stuff as well. In 1310, the government gave the people a new order, divided into local companies, which over time stabilized in 42 under the control of the um, Gonfalonieri dei Terzi. So the, these were the, the banner holders of the thirds that had, of course, uh, an organic um, uh, meaning. Unauthorized Dances and parties were also prohibited, as were meetings and conventicles of all kinds to prevent the sort of aggr- dangerous uh, mobs aggregations. While on the other hand, the sumptuary laws were heavy, so there was a balance. Like there was a pressure on the people, but there was also control morally on the type of again controlling those private. Um, uh, resources, at least in the measure in, in, in which they, they could be boasted by this family or the other publicly. Whereas it was a very serious understanding of what the, the local um, civile, this, this, is, this is on the nine, that they were quite effective, uh, the civile image, order, and so on. So, waste and sumptuous luxuries uh, were taken out. If they could generate envy and provoke, uh, etc. Because there was always a good chance to to unseat this world and making this mess. Now, the Nine were the uh, best government of Siena, as you already understood. Um, they took care of the prosperity of 
the commune, they embellish the city with the famous buildings that adorn it. So today make it one of the most beautiful cities in the world, one of, again, with the most, as you'll learn now also, um, cultural legacy in the history of mankind. Um, and in fact, they, as a government, they marked a period of greatest fame. Uh, for example, of, of the studium, the university of Siena, and the flourishing of the arts. Right? This is important to understand. Without banks, you cannot have art, you cannot have civilization. When people complain about civilization, it's the little people who complain about civilization. Those who can't have that control themselves because objectively they don't deserve it because they're incapable. Right? Um, the, here I, I inserted some of the... But Siena, you know, her... Uh, beauty is is a work of art in you know, itself. So, so all you see is what derives from this intelligence. Um, at the beginning of the 14th century, there was, uh, as you know, internationally a a series of, of uh, say a chain of bank failures. They started from Tuscany. Uh, they were connected with, a bit with the Angevin system as a whole. There were some these banks were connected with Naples as well with this old international trade. This this is the beginnings right of the cracking of the great medieval civilization that passes through this top um, you know uh, bankers. They all owe to privates fundamentally. And in 1309, uh, the bankruptcy of the Bonsignori Bank, right, and uh, was, for example, rekindling the uh, discord between the Ptolemy and the Salimbeni. These were famously, um, you know, opposed houses of Siena that were a bit like those guys we were describing before. I mean, those were very powerful, they have lots of lands in the countryside, they take care of their own business, you have to check them because they have towers, retinues, they have this big, you know, and they display their power as knights, as, uh, you know, so sort of lordly figures, right, that are the ones that everybody watches because they could take, they, may, they, they, they might take over uh, power. So this crisis, as you know, was very deep. Uh, it affected all of Europe, starting from Italian banks. Um, and it caused the collapse of some powerful Sienese families. Right? Investments were therefore diverted at that point by Siena to the countryside, to the land. This is uh, a very widespread dynamic throughout uh, the, the 14th century crisis. Basically, um, governments begin to reinvest heavily in territorialization. This has some important consequences, literally in, in the way they 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 properly control the the district. Right? There are greater fortifications. There is more taxes to 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 control more firmly, properly the the the, the local communities and and uh, militarily and so on. Um, the uh, uh, the government of the nine event leads towards a strong campaign of territorial conquests, right? Very calibrated, very wise, very one thing after the other. Um, in accordance, by the way, with a policy of balance with the neighboring Florence, with which um, they opted for a policy of cooperation. This period, they were both wealth. Yes, they had had this differences in the past, and euphemistically so. Um, but now they had fundamentally the same interests, the same international alignment. They um, are supported by uh, the the Angevin, so there is no need uh, at this point to break uh, this. That there were, there are always again some embers burning. Under the ashes, some Ghibellines are looking at changes, especially as we'll see now the reactivation of, uh, say, of imperial power uh, in Italy. Um, but uh, Siena remains pretty coherent throughout all this, um, and the main change uh, in the original scene is definitely the expedition of the Emperor Henry the Seventh. It was the, the first one after Conradin from from Germany. 
uh, and that was aimed at essentially uh, representing imperial authority in Italy to crush the uh, the Angevins. This, this would turn out to be a failure, but relatively so when you consider that basically al almost all of northern Italy was brought under control, especially Milan will remain uh, Ghibelline uh, for good, as you know. And uh, Henry VII targeted exactly the most uh, the Guelph axis of Tuscany. It was by far the most powerful, because Florence was booming uh, like as the, the greatest... Um, wealth center in Italy, first of all. It had a massive strategic relevance because it connected, again, central Italy to the Po Valley, through the the, uh, the tosco Emilian Apennine. It, it was the, literally the, the richest country in the world, right? Um, they financed this league that fundamentally counted, in fact, on the forces of Florence, Siena, uh, the Bolognese, and, and other... Uh, other several other communes that uh, really were, were might be reckoned with. So when Henry arrives, Siena, Florence, uh, and all these other allies knew that um, they would have become the target of the King of the Romans. That had to reach Rome, by the way, and passing through their territories in the first place. And since um, the imperial forces were occupied at least the first year in northern Italy by the uh, impetuous resistance of some Guelph cities, especially Cremona and, and Brescia, the latter of which was a terrible siege in which also plague spread, the, lots of imperial troops died, the same uh, Henry's brother was killed uh, during in combat, like, the, it was a really strange situation. Siena had time to organize herself in league with Florence. They recalled also many exiles, and the alliance included Lucca, Perugia. I made a video about medieval Perugia, by the way, uh, in depth. Um, and, of course, at this point, uh, all these forces were coordinated with the king of Naples, Robert of Anjou that sent some of his finest uh, Neapolitan French forces um, to, to, to back, of course, the, the Guelph resistance in the north. Um, he was formerly the captain of the Guelph party as such, right? So we will hopefully talk uh, in depth about Henry VII's uh, campaign. It is one of the most overlooked, perhaps, ever, because people, again, follow the, the idea of Dante, right? This guy is our last hope and then he allegedly didn't achieve anything. He achieved actually a freaking lot. Um, he b besieged Florence failing, but that was an incredible effort, right? The, the Florentines and their allies brought in the city something from 60 to 100,000 troops, something enormous. It tells you, like, this is the largest army basically ever gathered. The, the, the Imperials simply couldn't even attack the city, um, even if some parts of the walls were yet to be built, um, of the outer uh, circle, at least the newer one. Um, in any case, it, it tells you of the, the massive wealth. The log I mean, this literally is the, the richest center in the world, what they could put together in terms of financial power, logistics, supplies, military, and so on. Um, there is a defensive strategy. Uh, Henry was uh, had uh, succeeded in um, being crowned in Rome. However, half of the city was in the hands of the Ghibellines, the others in one of the Guelphs. Then he retreated. The result uh, from Flo Florence, the result is fight um, across the Tuscan countryside and uh, the, the retreat, ultimately, in winter 1313. Um, the the emperor withdraws to the to to the most Ghibelline piece about which I also made a bit in detail explaining their their what they were doing in the meanwhile. And when um, the um, when uh, in this new campaign in, in the summer thirteen, the emperor moved uh, towards Naples because back crossing, in fact, the Sienese, um, 
and with good prospects, right? Because the emperor was essentially laying siege to Siena herself, in a way, at least it was a possibility there to things to go ruinously bad, right? But the most important thing was capturing Naples, and at this point, the Neapolitans didn't have enough resources just to defend. Uh, you know, it, it was known by the Angevins that they were quite uh, they were quite worried at that point. Uh, the emperor's armies had been destroyed uh, in the in the uh, siege of Florence, but just with lots of other money from the, the Italian Ghibellines, the Aragonese, etc. In Pisa, he had created a new one from scratch. So it's only uh, Henry's death with malaria in Buon Convento on the Sienese district, so in enemy territory, at the end of the same August, that brings this to an abrupt end. That, however, is not over um, for the Ghibelline cause, right? Um, because, especially all the mercenaries, the Germans, that had remained in Henry's um, army, and now mm, were essentially coming back home, are hired by Pisa. So most of the struggle there against the Guelphs is continued in the following years. And Siena, at this point, joins Florence, uh, as always, um, in two, some of the most disastrous campaigns for the Guelphs, um, especially Pisa, led by uh, Uguccione, uh, della Fagiola, and um, later Luca, also always joining forces with Pisa, with one another at that point, because Uguccione had taken Luca as well from the Guelphs, uh, and Castruccio, Castracani, 1325, destroy the Guelph army ruinously. Uh, in 1350, the Siena, the Sienese always pay uh, uh, in this in this clashes a high toll for the for for the Guelph cause. Right, Montecatini in 1315 is is the biggest one, the one of the uh, the the nephew of. King Robert dies in battle, etc. The, the Sienese are in the first battle line of the Guelph armies. This is a sort of place of honor. And they uh, they are the first to, of course, be um, just to consume themselves because these were all formations in depth, you know, that um, there would be uh, things going on before the, the last or at least the second to be decisive. And there is a massive um, Sienese. Uh, bloodshed there. Um, the same goes for later encounters in which Siena keeps on sending troops, like even at this, for example, in Rome, where Henry VII was battling with, with the Guelphs, uh, led by the Ursini, uh, while well, the, the colonies, Romans, who were supporting him. Uh, Siena, Florence, sent an incredible amount of forces, lots of pavismen, pikemen, crossbowmen. Um, to to help in the this very locked scenario of heavily fortified Rome all you know covered in this grim defenses but impregnable uh, as a wall um in fact retaken right without too many problems at some point by different uh, say by the two sides depending on the situation we'll talk about this for Rome as well um in uh, in all this in 1318, because by the way the the, the Germans of Uguccione were raiding from Pisa into the Sienese, right, um, and everything was pretty messed up. But the nine held, except of course there were lots of expenses for the war, so there were serious revolts of the uh, butchers of the blacksmiths, uh, and then also the judges and notaries that were important uh, chunks of the of course. Of the Siena's establishment during the wars with Uguccione and Castruccio, Siena assists Florence also uh, r relentlessly, to say the least. There was, uh, after especially Al the, the the defeat of Alto Pascio, the year after in 1326, the recognition of a kind of high dominion of the Anjou as the head of Italian Guelphism. This was a way essentially to. Um, to 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 secure some further support from Naples, except uh, King Robert was e ever less able to provide forces to the 
uh, to the northern Italians, also because he was essentially always involved in major, massive, to say the least, expeditions against Sicily that all failed, right? Uh, the Aragonese defended themselves, uh, and you, you realize that the Neapolitan forces are dried up in, in the process, so there is the, the Italian Guelphs have to start... Um, working a bit on their own, and, and in part they're also glad at this because the crisis is generalized. Um, more than else, they're worried about the Milanese expansionism on the longer run. Also, of course, there were other Ghibelline powers here, but some of them were relatively short-lived. Uh, um, so the idea is that uh, there is a general deparishment of the situation. Right. Until the 30s, the 40s, you, you had still some robust um, bulwark represented by Siena, for example, that doesn't have major expansionistic aims, but is still very rich. Right, With the crisis of the mid-14th century, things start to change. Um, there are interesting episodes in this decade, also military-wise. Um, for example, the, a great leader of the Republic in this period, uh, in this period was the famed uh, Guido Riccio da Fogliano uh, that is repeatedly appointed as war captain of Siena starting from 1327 especially during the military campaign in, in Maremma and the Tyrrhenian coast against Pisa and the Aldobrandeschi against Massa, these other towns of the coasts um, in 1328 Guido Riccio takes Montemassi, um, that is defended by uh, Castruccio Castracani, and Sassoforte. Um, in 1331, Arcidosso, uh, Scansano, and in fact, finally, Massa, maritime Massa. Um, the following year, Guido Riccio defeats the peasants in Giuncarico. In 1333, uh, Guidericho is uh, driven out of Siena, however, probably out of fear of the power and popularity it was acquiring. So, so as we were observing before, the, also the, the, the republican institutions are the perishing to some degree. There is uh, uh, a greater fragility in even those mechanisms. The strong men can fundamentally exalt um, the, the mob uh, with, let's say, the, because of the the heavy cost of the system, but Siena holds at this point. Structurally, it's, it's very, very solid, right? And as a consequence, in 1336, even a sizable town like Grosseto was definitely conquered by the CNAs. Um, furthermore, impetus was given to the consolidation works. There is a great work of, of further fortification uh, of, say, a disruption of opposition. Uh, at many levels, uh, especially the, the popular forces are brought down. Uh, there is a sort of, of course, of seigneurial territorial control from Siena on these surrounding towns. Like Siena never, at this point, engages in in a. Aside from Grosseto, Grosseto is basically the largest center. That was one of the smallest uh, in Italy, uh, at least among the, say, the communes of some size. Like we can identify. More evenly, they, Siena doesn't go like Florence or other cities in like knocking at I don't know uh, at somebody else's door and say I will I want to conquer you. In part because Florence is is monopolizing the scene a bit, so cities like there weren't so many options for for Siena that was uh, Arezzo, the, but you know that was more like um, you know under just direct pressure of the Florentines, it could be supplied by others. From the Apennines, it would happen. Pisa was also a major power. You wouldn't like to simply crush out there, and you know, the CNA, the, say to, to to get crushed actually in the process um, of, of trying to take it out in some ways. Not even Florence manages to do so. And as we've seen, the CNAs actually channel their forces through the the Florentine path, right, of the Arno Valley to try to crush Pisa at some point. But they're mostly on the defensive because Florence just is beaten the hell out. of um, they, are, they are the richest city in the world, but they can't even establish a regional uh, domination fundamentally. Um, Siena has some con con important contact with areas like the northern Lazio. I made a video about medieval Lazio and also partly of Umbria, but 
um, they're small centers. They don't give much of a... They're also in the hands of, of the Papal State, so there could have not been a way, especially in the Guelph axis, to like a possible expansion. So in a way, they just have to sit and, you know, just cooperate, right? And, and being, again, clearing the, the district from rebels, trying to, to subjugate especially these forces um, in in Maremma that uh, will strengthen the access to the sea and similar things. Um, so they content themselves also with uh, fortifying, which is important for control, um, internal and external. Uh, Paganico and Talamone are fortified heavily, right? Uh, these places were obtained uh, to Siena by the, the monks of uh, the, the uh, Miata Mount in 1303. Uh, the port of Talamone is strengthened, as well as the reinforcement works on the fortress of Montalcino and Buon Convento began at this point. Um, you have also the completion of the walls of Siena herself. So this is typical of the era, right? The crisis, greater defense, rather than venturism or major campaigns, at least Siena is not, um, probably also not capable of doing so, right? Uh, financially, this would have caused too much of a burden uh, that would, would have led to upheavals politically and just uh, uh, the, these single communes had not, especially in Tuscany, they had tendentially not developed in, into some sort of uh, multi-city signory like in northern Italy that now were in fact coming to threaten Tuscany herself and so this Guelph block. Um, together with the Guelphs, essentially, uh, Siena saw the victory over Lucca in Pisa, right? Not for her, but still to, yeah, to clear a bit th that problem that had bothered her in her southern area. Yet, the war had exhausted the finances and desolated the countryside, uh, right? There were raids into each other's uh, districts and so on. So in 1348 you have the Black Death, which kills about two-thirds of the population in Siena, right? That according to the most reliable calculations would have been of 70,000 inhabitants. This was a very heavy blow, and as we've seen, many important cities eventually lost to, to others just because of this incredible uh, hit, right? They were able, of course, to resist better, especially as cities on compared to the countryside, paradoxically. You had you could have lots of people dying in the city, but at the end of the day, the city grew stronger than the countryside. It was much more affected, because um, they were just more vulnerable, more fragile. They, they said in the city you had more, uh, more resources, both morally and, and materially. Yet, you have some external power that starts essentially profiting of this, right? Uh, Europe is tending towards statual uh, uh, institutions, you know, so to a level of territorial extent that um, the single cities do not normally uh, attain or can attain. Uh, in any case, it had been during the government of the nine, also known as the Buon Governo, so the good government, that the richest and most prolific work for art in the Republic had been uh, achieved, right? If the most impressive aspects of the previous two centuries are made up of the great works of common utility, from the great doors to the fountains, this period is marked by a great visual art of the Sienese school. This has to do with a bit like nowadays, that we fixate uh, the disease of abundance just with imagery, with a sort of something that is a contemplative nature, but help of, of results of, of works of art. Um, Siena had put herself in direct competition with Florence and Giotto's uh, creation. The Siena's um, artistic goldsmith's art was also dramatically advanced. Right? Uh, Siena had been artistically a bit more conservative compared to Florence. She looked a bit more Byzantine, right? Florence uh, with, with Giotto with, opens to a sort of uh, 
much more Apollonian, Roman, classical vision, right? Uh, Florence is the true capital of humanism, of the Renaissance in the in the centuries, in the 14th, in the 15th. But uh, the Sene is open too, right? There is a uh, an evolution where you have among the painters, Duccio di Buoninsegna, Simone Martini, Pietro, and Ambrogio Lorenzetti, the sculptor Tino di Camagliano, and the bequests of the um, facade and interiors of the cathedral. You can admire these pictures by Giovanni and Nicola Pisano that were uh, active between the end of the 13th century and the wall of the 14th century up to the Great Plague. So these are, as you know, some of the greatest names in, in medieval art. Um, and just, I think, the images here speak by, by themselves. Uh, their works of art became coveted throughout all Christendom. Uh, Italy at this point was you know, just like, I made a video about the Italian Trecento that explains a bit within this um, Guelph axis why art had boomed so much, and why this goes in parallel with a dramatic level of civilizational output among various things. Um, so Siena is very much at the heart of this movement um, as well. Uh, we have, during the nine, uh, for example, in 1310, the government finally settling in the new public palace in the Piazza del Campo, right, the most iconic uh, uh, landmark of of, uh, of Siena with with the bell tower, with the um, with the f famous palio being uh, run uh, in, in the square. Um, this again place was already used for the the, the little battle, the, the pugna as they were called, uh, as it was called. At the time, there were other games, such as the one of the Elmora, uh, the games of St. George, right? Um, you have also some symbolism there, the shell shape, uh, for example, appearing decoratively, etc., uh, connected with these activities. So, um, a, a great period uh, throughout this, this, entire, this entire time. Religious processions and demonstrations took place instead in the um, cathedral square. Given the division of spaces as well as roles between the civic and ecclesiastical power, um, uh, in spite of the fact that the hospital of Saint Mary that was at, at this point in the hands of the commune, with its granaries and in fact hospitals scattered throughout the territory of the republic and also abroad as well as the provision of banking services to pilgrims, which brought an enormous amount of money to the state coffers. Um, so the fact of controlling the entire city, as we've seen, in effect, in the, in the same year, um, after a long drafting work, the entry into force of the new constitution of the commune, in the vernacular language, importantly enough, um, is, uh, is, is carried out. Uh, there is... Uh, here, a uh, most extensive work, right? The first ever not in Latin written, uh, so in su such size. Um, its realization of great value comes as often happens due to unedifying events, actually, because there had been the, the failure of the Grand Tavola, the great bank of the Buon Signore that we mentioned before, uh, which had. Uh, recently occurred, so all the various bankruptcies and great scandals uh, that had seen the, the CNAs and the Florentine bankers as protagonists had, um, of course, uh, caused pretty big changes in the various European courts because, uh, again, they needed this money um, for making their own wars, for, again, making this whole thing go. So the new document um, which resumed norms already existing in the previous constitutions of Siena up to the last one of 1262, contained precisely traditional norms, but also new ones to remedy the situation of the, this, this crisis. So trying to stop the negative um, uh, dynamics, mechanisms that were going on. In the mid-14th century, you have 
finally the, uh, the, the, the final events, the, the, the final stray that lead to the fall of the government of the Nye uh, that followed one another in just a few years. Like It's interesting to see. We've seen it also with Pisa, how quick these changes could be. Right, how a city that was so powerful and among the first in Europe uh, um, at the time, at least in a political way, lost um, its autonomy right, to other powers, or at least um, remained lagged behind right, and didn't make it to, to evolve into something more, um, uh, let's say, more, more powerful uh, on her own. As we've seen in 1348, Siena was seriously hit by the Black Death, right? Literally half, if not more, its population, which um, was already exhausted in previous years by this mounting corruption of the magistrates, especially of the Bicarna and other high financial magistrates um, in the city. Um, and there was a, a revolt against the Noven who practically were, uh, um, weren't able to do anything else but employing a mercenary army for the repression of the rebels. This caused numerous deaths, right? the sacking of Siena in the summer of 1354, among the other things. Um, as you can imagine, this destabilized the situation. Disorders continued until the following year, when... Charles IV of Luxembourg, um, so the, at this point the hem emperor that uh, had already been in Italy in the, in the previous decades fighting during these various uh, clashes for the various communes, um, who, uh, issued in fact a, um, a change, a radical change uh, to the cry of uh, of uh, death to deny and long live the emperor. So the idea was that this guy would have, it was just like passing by, right? It was not to stay, but there could that he could tip the balance in favor of uh, the the popular elements. Uh, so this is not like a positive thing, even in terms of what the uh, the the Nova had done, right? The uh, the uh, Noveski, as were called were competent governors. They weren't uh, actually more or less mm, corrupted than what all these players we're reading of, um, you know, were uh, at the time. So they, th th this was mostly like a chance for um, someone else, right, to take advantage of the situation to allow someone else to take control in exchange for money that would have still been paid by the community just to overthrow the guys you didn't like, right? Um, so the this is how, by the way, the novel ended as this, this period of otherwise extraordinary stability, development, exceptional prosperity of, of the commune that, as we have said, underwent a decline of, uh, after uh, these events. Um, that, as you understand, are not positive at all, and combined with the discontent aroused uh, by this, the, you know, first again that some, the somehow what absolute monopoly that the nine had made of go government, but also the, you know, the the brutality of these uh, mechanisms uh, of overthrowing had. First of all, let um, lose though all those families that, first of all, the, the state had managed to, to keep down. In fact, what happened in 1355 um, was not simply led just by the people, because you may imagine, but the, also the magnate families of the Piccolomini, the Tolomei, the Saracini, the Salimbeni. These were people that had all the interest in essentially breaking free and monopolizing control themselves, but as privates fundamentally. Um, and this is, these are the forces that Emperor Charles IV uh, uh, exploited, right? Uh, so and we lost so much by um, 
especially the, the fire, the archives, the looting of the various houses during the sack, etc. So it was actually a total disaster that would have not um, really allowed the commune to, to go on as before. Right. Um, what was the consequence of this disaster? Well, an all popular government known as the one of the twelve, which included, by the way, numerous disciples of St. Catherine, that was gaining a bit the sense of, uh, you know, of desolation, of, uh, uh, of the situation internationally, the fact that the papacy was not there anymore, etc. So it, there's a mix of instances from various sides. Naturally, the nine were excluded, um, and after an initial moment in which they had been admitted, um, they um, they were essentially kept out. And magnates would still be excluded, of course, from this government. The magnates must give up their political offices, and uh, so they didn't win themselves either uh, too much. There was a sense that this, the commune was too prestigious to simply let everybody doing what, what they wanted, or you know, just overthrowing the nine, then 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 what? Exactly. Um, there were some further changes introduced by the new regime of the Twelve. The exclusion from the government and from eligibility for anyone who had participated in the previous political experience. So you understand the populistic essence of such uh, meaning. Uh, the Those who had been part of the Nine, as we've seen, um, in the this went as far as ex uh, as extending the ban from to the families all over to which the the nine had belonged right so all this ensured in part of course uh, greater political participation on the part of the people enlarging the basis of eligibility the possibility of rotation in public office but it became ever more spiraling of, of you know practical control um there was some war that still was necessary to be fought at this point. The Twelve, in 1359, made a war with Perugia in Umbria regarding especially uh, the conditions of Montefulciano and Cortona because these areas were in the east and they had somehow remained a bit more detached from Siena's power and when there was a... Um, uh, a political crisis like the one we just described, they do try to, you know, to to invite others, uh, and uh, in the hope of autonomy of decentralization, these are the magnates fundamentally operate behind the scenes to do so. Um, in any case, the, there was a peace that ended with the compromise, um, in which saw the assignment of the High Dominion over Cortona to Siena and that of Montepulciano to Perugia. In 1360, Montalcino was retaken, that was closer to, to Siena, so uh, it had in the past events escaped several times from the Sienese Dominion, but now was kept under once again. So you understand continuous rebellions actually also in, in the countryside from, from Massa, from Maremma, from the great feudal lords. Um, this movement shows how precarious CNA's power was over the countryside at this point. That was also run, as we will see now, by uh, the, the soldiers of fortune. Like It was a, a moment of great destabilization. There had also been a as we said at the beginning, like always this sort of local presence of lineages that had never wanted to be under the commune and they, they, they worked continuously to um, to avoid being brought under. Uh, this in insight was rendered possible just by the fact that the CNA's families in the city uh, kept on fighting with one another rather than addressing these issues unitarily. Right, so there was a weakened government. The call for a rebellion from the various discontented parts. Um, and this is the reason why the government of the Twelfth was also short-lived. 
right? Only uh, more, but more than a decade. In 1368, Charles the Fourth passed once again by Siena, um, and on the occasion, a coalition of magnate families with imperial support dismissed the magistracy of the twelfth and the short lived government of the thirteenth arose. This is a sort of sort of it, it becomes you know just like a mockery of, of the original thing. Um, the thirteenth at this point were a sort of noble dictatorship made up of ten nobles and three representatives of the people. Right? They held office for three weeks only. It's also ridiculous as you understand. Uh, then you have in 1369 the government of the 15, just to change, right? Not to see the point. Um, this was interesting because it saw the return of the Noveski, the also the, the one of the twelves um, and say other reformers in 1379, uh, 71. The nine and the twelve were ousted from the government once again. That remained in the sole hands of this uh, of the reformers, so-called, uh, belonging to the lowest strata of the urban population. Again, pure p populism in a disastrous situation. In fact, uh, in the meantime, companies of fortune from the Gamba Corti and John Oakwood desolated the territory of Siena. The city was at war now with, with Milan, by the way, because the Milanese had, uh, with their scenery, extended up to central Italy. Uh, was an enormous monster, basically, compared to this soul. Uh, communes still trying to stand on, on their feet individually. Bernabeu Visconti and Gregory XI had basically joined forces against Siena herself. It was difficult for the Visconti to control Tuscany, right? They had problems on their own. Uh, at every succession crisis, they would lose these more distant places. Um, but they were able, in the meanwhile, to extend their influence, their say their their general prestige, right? And they did have some chance at a point to take over the entire central northern Italy. The peace was concluded in 1380 by Urban VI against um, the Farnese and Viterbo. Um, new plagues uh, increased the ruins, um, but finally a victorious conclusion to, to this mess had been somehow reached. Right. Um, the regime of the reformers on the basis of this stability lasted until 1385. Here, say, Italy was recovering from some of the most turbulent phase of followed to the 14th century crisis. Um, in 1385 you have uh, the reformers being overthrown by a revolt in which the nobles, the Noveschi and the popular fringes, not included in the reformers, united to so sort of coming back. From 1385 to 1399, you have a government of the 10, 1386, 87, of the 11 from 1388 to 98. Then you have the 12 priors from 1398 to uh, 1399. You understand how rapidly they succeeded one another, and this uh, institutional changes essentially reflect the. Um, the, the the way right uh, the triumphant party band uh, would uh, exclude the others right increasingly exacerbating the enmities by the way so this was an impasse that was never really surpassed by by the city and those who would take advantage of these troubles were the Florentines who had in the meanwhile conquered Montepulciano and other lands formerly uh, owned by the Sienese. Um, this was threatening enough because Siena, after all, had a, a large um, and powerful district. It, I mean, everybody had been struck by the crisis. There were similar situations pretty much everywhere. Florence, however, was uh, the by far the most unitary power in Tuscany. And this uh, threat from Florence, that just up to like a couple of generations before, like, was just a friend of Siena, uh, just is a sort of coming back to, I don't know, 
the mid 13th century, right? So the Sienese at that point realized that um, there is a need of defense. Uh, the eleven then placed themselves under the protection of a of a foreign ruler that is Gian Galeazzo Visconti, who in 1399 was was given the lordship of Siena. What was the point of this? Well, the point was that, as we said before, the Milanese couldn't quite control Siena directly, right? But it would have this powerful guy there who would essentially float on the local support. That would be enough to get some extra resource and um, essentially undermining, by at this point, making Siena explicitly passing to the enemy of Florence, right? You know, um, essentially... Um, uh, preserve uh, at least in part the the countryside. It's a form of seigneury. It, it is a seigneury, as a matter of fact, as uh, the, the Italian lordships uh, basically are at this point. Just it's very decentralized, right? So that um, the situation evolves, uh, in fact, uh, rapidly as well. Uh, when the Visconti died, Siena remains aligned with Milan, right, until 1404. Um, when uh, a special balia formed a new government of ten priors drawn from the uh, the Monti and the orders of the Nove, the reformers and the people. Uh, so again, this is some sort of coalition that was supposed to hold. And they decided that uh, it was useless, especially to continue the war with Florence, now that the Milanese had been oriented elsewhere because basically they were ever more uh, now there had been some resizement in power and they they had other things to, to take control of um, so not just a peace is made with Florence but also an alliance with her in 1410 the latter especially motivated uh, by the threat posed by the King Ladislas of Naples um, that had been, um, you know, uh, harassing Siena. When Ladislas died, um, the uh, seaports of Maremma, previously lost to the Neapolitan ruler, were reconquered. Uh, Sovana, um, uh, that is a, another town, was occupied, and the dominions of uh, Giacomo's Forza in the Orcha Valley were as well. Uh, so regarding the latter, there had been some friction, by the way, because uh, Braccio da Montone, the Lord of Perugia, had designs on that um, on the Orcha Valley and those territories. So at this point, it was thought that Siena would simply back down. Right. Instead, they gradually began to reacquire a bit of territorial control. At this point, Siena was a sort of provincial power still. Florence, to like because of this republican profile, they they hadn't developed as super expansionistic powers like uh, again the, the lordships, um, like kingdoms, etc. So Florence was also relatively weak, like Tuscany was seen as a place where you could infiltrate in a way or another, at least it had been so in the last generations, and it was still a place you, you, you would need, however, to take now in consideration, because a sort of order was taking place um, in which uh, that would lead to 1454, you know, the Peace of Lodi, where basically Italian states realized that Yes, they could try to destabilize one another, but it was very difficult to simply just have just one to take over the entire thing because everybody was paranoid of that. Right? It's a bit like what happened within Siena with the the with the Noven, the sort of reform. Right? Uh, there is actually a lot going on in the wars between Alfonso of Aragon and Florence. Uh, Siena was first allied with the king. Um, but after, in fact, 1454, she passed again to the Florentine alliance. And she had to suffer from the uh, depredation of the war bands of um, Jacopo Piccinino. So these soldiers of fortune that at this point were just becoming the official, essentially, means that the Italian lordships had to, to harass one another. Um, so... 
in the same 1454, um, a new Balia was appointed. This became permanent and independent from the consistory of Siena, unlike the previous ones uh, that had represented a sort of secret committee of the council, right, and, and ended up centralizing political power within herself. Um, there were some issues at this point with the captains that were maintained by Siena that began to defect, to betray, right? They, they alternated with the conspiracies fomented by uh, a local nobleman, Antonio Petrucci, that tried to take control of the city on its own. So some calm was achieved when Pope Pius II Piccolomini intervened uh, in the Sienese um, by ele elevating uh, the the local see to an archbishop, right? and the sense was establishing some greater power locally, so they could reinforce also the uh, the lay institutions. However, after 1464, um, there was um, a continuous change in a number of priors, which um, were you know uh, s coped with by further changes. Uh, to government, to institutions, etc., but to no greater success. In 1480, the Nobe and the popular drove of the reformers, together with the help by the Duke of Calabria, was ever more involved, like now, in ever more international pressure, like in general, also welcomed uh, in the, no uh, the nobles into the council of the city. In 1482, however, the latter were excluded and finally in the same year the nine were also banned as you would say this is crazy like they were just not getting anywhere well it's exactly the point right among the latter however that expelled was uh, Pandolfo Petrucci who um, at that point became the leader of the exiles and managed in 1487 to enter Siena by surprise which was very much the way to do th things at the time so that he established a government in which all orders were represented, interestingly enough. But in reality, from then on, he was the real master, right? Just look at the Medici, right? The sense that they weren't in charge, like, just not. Uh, they, they, it was all the other organisms of the Republic that ruled, right? But it wasn't the case. He knew how to maintain power uh, despite internal opposition, and the pitfalls of Cesare Borgia, by the way, favoring the arts, improving the the condition. So after all, uh, the the CNA's weight signory would have probably spared um, if uh, happening before, like lots of these kind of issues. But evidently. It's difficult to do so in a in a city that knows, however, how it is worth it is worth to have a balance, to have a um, an awareness of the, the the past prestige of republican institutions, the fact that in theory you can make things work. Just these are incredibly fragile mechanisms, and you can't quite immediately think to how to solve them when. The situation is so heavily unbalanced, right? So, it's definitely a a problem that uh, is quite evident in Siena, even more than than other places. Telling the truth, uh, after and and contrasting with an otherwise incredibly, um, you know, advanced uh, mechanism that wasn't. Uh, you know, otherwise uh, seeming to be bad. Like, the, the government of the Nine was really one of, producing one of the greatest peaks in, you know, European, as we've seen, art, stability, prosperity, uh, institutional development, even military success, and so on. So, when that came to an end, as the best of some, you know, really institutional development, uh, things start going bad. So reflect on the value of that and how much you can make it work if you really want to instead of having these constant quarrels.
getting nowhere. So we will keep talking about CNA's history at some point. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.